Good evening, everyone. Uh, once again, uh, we're so happy that God is giving us opportunity to share with one another the Word of God, to look into His Word and see what the Word is trying to touch, teach us today. And as usual, we have already done our preliminaries and we've already prayed and we believe the Spirit of God is with us and is leading us. And today's topic is something that is very familiar. It's a very familiar subject that uh, you and me know. And uh, the title I've entitled my message, Sin and Salvation. Sin and Salvation. Now, you will notice in the Bible that every time God gives a, a teaching, let's say the day of worship, the devil always has, has an, a counterfeit. When we teach about the second coming of Christ, devil has a counterfeit teaching on that. When you're teaching about the basis of the New Testament, the gospel of Christ Jesus, the devil has come up with his own counterfeit gospel. And to, tonight, we're going to look at the true gospel and the false gospel. Now, you and me can differ on the issues that borders on doctrines. You and me can, uh, can, can differ on how we interpret prophecy. But one thing we should never differ is on the gospel of Jesus Christ. Because if you have a foreign gospel that is not found in the scripture, it may cost you your salvation. And I'm going to repeat that. If you have a foreign gospel that is not proclaimed in the scriptures according to the word of God, it may cost you your salvation. So tonight we're going to look at what is what does the true gospel say in terms of sin and salvation? What does the false gospel say in terms of sin and salvation? And you'd be surprised that the majority of the Christian dome, they believe a false, false gospel. Not because it's out of choice, but because they don't study. Because they believe what they are taught, what they are taught, and what they are taught. Somebody standing in front of the congregation and teaches them, and they take it and run away with it. But today, we're going to go into the Bible and contrast and compare the two Gospels. Now, there, uh, let me start with the first Gospel. I'll be going point by point, and I'm going to enumerate about five points with thee. First point, the first Gospel says, you are born a sinner. Every child, every baby that is born from a mother coming into this world is born a sinner. That is a false gospel. Now, this gospel was propagated at the beginning by a man, a bishop, it's a Roman Catholic bishop known as St. Augustine or Augustine of Hippo. This man is the one that propagated this gospel, a false gospel, that a human being is born a sinner as low as, as the day he comes into this world. Now, even in our churches today, let's say, for example, in the Seventh-day Adventist church, we have heard this gospel being preached. Now you'd ask me, how did he come into our church, Seventh-day Adventist church? There was a man called Desmond Ford. Desmond Ford took this false gospel from a man called St. Augustine, a Catholic bishop, and brought it into an Adventist church. And you know the story of what happened to Desmond Ford. Desmond Ford is no longer one of our pastors. Now, a human, being, a human being cannot be born a sinner because the Bible gives a definition of what sin is. Let's go to the scripture. In 1 John chapter 3 and verse 4, 1 John chapter 3 and verse 4, the Bible is very clear. It says, Whosoever committeth sin transgresseth also the law. For sin is the transgression of the law. So we know that sin is the transgression of the law. So a baby that is born today, what, trans what law did he or she transgress? And that is why these people, they baptize babies. We see that it's creeping into our church today. We are baptizing eight-year-olds, nine-year-olds, when we are not supposed to do that. This is a false gospel. Baptizing babies, thinking they're, they're born with sin, is a false gospel. But what does the true gospel say? The true gospel says sin is a choice. 
Sin is not who you are. You are not born a sinner. Sin is a choice. You choose to sin. You choose to transgress the law of God. You make a choice to turn your, way, your back against God, even when the Holy Spirit tells you what you want to do is wrong. But you deliberately make a conscious decision to sin against God. That is sin. Now, Ellen White does not use the word um, sinful nature because there is no such word as sinful nature. The correct word is human nature or fallen nature. We either have a human nature or a fallen nature. But let me correct myself. Ellen White does use the word, but she only uses it when she's talking about when Christ was in the garden of Gethsemane, when he took the sin of the world and the sin of the world was put on himself. And that is when she uses the word sinful nature because Christ became sin for us. That is the only way, but she uses it in context. She doesn't say Christ is a sinner, as we will see as, as we progress in our study. Now, Adam and Eve, when they were created, they had a sinless nature, or we all know that. They could commune with God because they were just as, as good as God. Holiness, the holiness of God, the, 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 the nature of God. But after sin, after they sinned, God took them out of the garden, and we know that now they had a fallen nature. The word fallen just comes from failing because they failed to meet, to meet the standard of God. They failed to, to maintain the standard of God, so they have a fallen nature. In other words, we can say they have a human nature after they sinned. Let's go to the Bible again so that the Bible helps us understand what we're saying. Romans chapter 8. Now, Romans chapter 8 and verse 10, the Bible is very clear. Now, talking about Christ now. 8 verse 10, and if Christ be in you, the body is dead because of sin. Now, when you become a born again Christian, when you are baptized, Christ comes into you. The spirit of the world departs from you. The spirit of Christ comes in you. You are born again. And the Bible says the body, the flesh, dies. But the spirit is life because of righteousness. So at that point, you cease to be a sinner. You cease to, to have a, a, a fallen nature. Now you become a born again Christian. Now, looking at the definition of sin the correct and biblical definition of sin. If you study that from 1 John 3 verse 4, and you do an exegetical study on that verse, you see that the nature of sin will define us, will define man. Let me say that again. The nature of sin, the correct understanding of sin, will define the nature of man. The nature of man will define the nature of Christ. And the nature of Christ will define the nature of the atonement. And the nature of the atonement will define the nature of salvation. Let me explain that step by step, what I mean. The correct interpretation of the definition and the nature of sin will give us a correct interpretation of the nature of man before he's born again and after he's born again. Are you with me? We're going to understand what it means sin is a transgression of the law. We understand that man only transgressed the law because he chooses to, to transgress the law because he is not supposed to transgress the law once he becomes a born again. The nature of man will help us to understand the nature of Christ. Because if you say, according to the first gospel, that man was born a sinner, it means then that Christ was born a sinner. When he was born as a babe in Bethlehem, you're telling me he was born a sinner. Now, if he was born a sinner, how then can he be our savior? How can he be our savior if he was born a sinner? 
So the correct interpretation of what sin is will give us a correct understanding of the nature that Christ had. Christ had a nature like that of Adam and Eve after they fell the standard that God had put for them. So we have a clear understanding once we get a correct interpretation of what sin is. Whether somebody is born a, sin, a sinner or, or somebody makes a choice to sin. Christ never sinned. He never made a choice to sin. So you could not say that every man who, or woman that borns in this world is born a sinner. So because you cannot say that Christ is a sinner. The correct understanding and interpretation of the nature of Christ will give us the correct understanding and the nature of the atonement. The Bible says God was in Christ reconciling the world. So Christ was God and man. If you understand the correct interpretation of 1 John 3, 4, sin is transgression of the law, we will better understand the atonement that Christ, God is in Christ reconciling the world unto himself. Once we understand the nature of the atonement, we will understand the nature of our salvation. Because we, if, for us to understand what salvation is, we must understand what God did to, to, to bring us back to him. The nature and understanding of the definition and interpretation of what sin is, is the linchpin. That's the, the premise. That's the basis. That's the foundation of understanding our salvation. So I hope that beginning this evening, as you will hear me interpret and preach and share with you this message, you will gain a proper understanding of what sin is and a proper understanding of our salvation. Let's move on to the second point. So the first point was the nature of sin. And the second point we're going to look at is the nature of Christ. So I'm going to go a little bit further to explain the nature of Christ. I know now this is a very controversial point. It's a very controversial point in Christendom. And most of the Bible, uh, uh, Bible uh, uh, readers or, or people who have, who have, who have tried to come up with a proper understanding of the nature of Christ, they will discourage you. They will discourage you and say, don't go there because it is very controversial. But I'm going to just touch on the, on, the, on the surface just to give us a clear understanding of sin and salvation. Now, remember now, Lucifer or Satan or the devil claim that no one can keep the law. And even after Adam and Eve sinned in the Garden of Eden, he almost proved this point that no one can keep the law of God. Now, who disapproved that point? Only Christ so far has disapproved that point because we are not glorified yet. We are still in this world and we are susceptible to sin. We couldn't sin. We are not supposed to sin as Christians, but that doesn't negate the fact that we can sin because we're still not glorified yet. But Christ is possessing our same bodies that we have today. He never sinned. So only Christ so far has disproved that lie and called the devil a liar. So let's read uh, Romans chapter 8 and verse 3. Because the Bible gives us uh, just to expand on the nature of Christ. Romans 8 and verse 3 says, For what the law could not do, in that it was weak through the flesh, God sending his own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh, and for sin, condemned sin in the flesh. Now I want you to underline the word likeness. Is it, is it saying that Christ was almost like us? Christ was just like us in the likeness of man in the likeness of sinful flesh. So Christ had a flesh just like you and me. He had no, no advantage over us. Now when the Bible says flesh, you see, you will see that that's, that's word coming up often in my study this evening, in the likeness of sinful flesh. 
When the Bible says flesh, it's not talking about what you and me know as this flesh, a body, or the flesh, the meat that we eat. When the Bible talks about flesh, it talks about the fallen nature. It talks about the fallen nature, the mind and the body. The mind and the body, the fallen nature of man. That's what it means, flesh here. It's not talking about the flesh and the body that we have. Let's emphasize that by reading Philippians 2 verse 7. Philippians chapter 2 and verse 7. The Bible says, let's, let me start with verse 6. Who being in the form of God, who is that? Christ. Who being in the form of God thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation and took upon him the form of a servant. Let me pause right there for a moment. So Christ took upon himself the form of a servant. It's the same thing. The word flesh and the word servant, they have a different meaning in the Greek. The, se the word servant here, as you know, some of you have uh, other, uh, other versions of the Bible, and it says clearly the servant means a slave. So when Adam and Eve, for example, when before they sinned in the Garden of Eden, they were not slaves, they were free from sin. But once they sinned, they became slaves to sin. So Christ had a nature that was under the nature that Adam and Eve had after the fall. He was a servant, meaning he was slave to sin. He could have sinned, but he did not. And was made in the likeness of men. He was just like us. That's what Paul is trying to say. Christ was just like us. He was in the, made in the likeness of men. He was a servant, a slave to sin. He was, although he was in the form of God, but he, he, he brought himself down to our level. So we can have a level playing field, us and him. There is no advantage of him over us. Now I'm going to read uh, what Ellen White has written in the book Desire of Ages on page 122. And she writes, In our own strength it is impossible for us to deny the clamor of our fallen nature. Mark that word. Through this channel, Satan will bring temptation, second word, upon us. Christ knew that the enemy would come to every human being to take advantage of hereditary weakness. That's the third word. And by passing over the ground which man must travel, our Lord has prepared a way for us to overcome. So three words come up out of that uh, passage. The clamor of our fallen nature, temptation, and the hereditary weakness. These three, they are not sin. We are tempted. We have a hereditary weakness that we, can, we got from Adam and Eve. And we have a fallen nature that is clamoring for supremacy over us. And these things are not sin. They are not sin. Sin is a transgression of the law. And Christ had these three things. But listen to what he says, the last sentence, I'll read it again. Our Lord has prepared a way for us to overcome. And just as he overcame in the same nature that he had, we can overcome if we maintain a relationship with him. If we trust him and obey him. These are the only true things that we can, can help us to overcome and to live and Christ has lived in this earth. Now you will notice that in Hebrews chapter 4 verse 15, that verse emphasizes my point that Christ was tempted in all points. In every point that you are tempted, Christ was tempted. So you have no excuse when you transgress God's law. Because just as I have shown here in my second point of my teaching, that Christ had a nature like us, but he overcame and we can overcome if we put our trust in him. When we are born again, we just come to the same level as Christ was. When we are born again and we profess to be Christians, we are baptized, we come to the same level as Christ was. Therefore, we are not expected to sin. If we are truly born again, we will not sin, just as Christ never sinned. You can have victory over sin. I can assure you, brother and sister. You can have victory over sin. You can have the mind of Christ because you accept him into your life as personal savior. The same Christ that had the same 
uh, fallen nature like us, but he, overcome, he overcame. The, uh, Ellen White says that as we follow him, he has made a way for us so we can overcome just as he overcame. Now, the fourth gospel, still on my second point, says that Christ did not have a fallen nature. That Christ had a nature before, like the one that Adam and Eve, before they, they sinned, before they fell. But that's false. Christ had a nature just like you and me. All right, we're moving on to the third point. The third point in the teaching of sin and salvation is justification. When you look at the first gospel that is being preached today, in the majority of Christendom, they will tell you that only justification matters, sanctification doesn't matter. That when justification is, is imputed unto you, you become a Christian. Once you are saved, you are saved forever. Now, there may be people who, who are saying, what, what does it mean, the word justification? Let me explain it to you in simple terms. You see, Paul used a lot of uh, legal terms to explain salvation and grace. Let me give you an example. At least once a year, in every country in the world, maybe on the day that they, they had their independence, the president of the country, he pardons some prisoners. Are you with me? It happens here in America. It happens in most of the countries. A president pardons some, uh, some, some prisoners. They're let free. Now, that's some form of justification. But there's a little difference. The prisoners that the president frees, they deserve to be freed because of their good conduct in prison. They deserve to be freed well, maybe because they are political prisoners and now there's a new government, so the new government forgives them. So they, they deserve to be forgiven. But in the sense of Christ, in the sense of the Bible, justification is given to people who do not deserve to be forgiven just like you and me. We do not deserve to be forgiven. So we, Christ comes now, God, God sends Christ to us to come and justify us. Are we together? He stands on our behalf and takes, makes a way for us. <clears throat> so we are justified through Christ. He makes us justified. He makes us just. When we were wrong, he makes us just. Now the first gospel will tell you that you only need justification. You don't need obedience after that. Once you accept Jesus Christ and somebody just prays for you, they tell you to touch the TV screen or just prays for you and say, you are in your home, just repeat a prayer after me. And then he finishes the prayer and say, that's it, you are saved. Don't worry about it. You are saved. Jesus Christ has saved you. That is a false gospel. You can live the way you want. You can sin the way you want. Just believe, that's what, they, that's what they preach. Only believe, only believe because you are justified, Christ justified you. These same people, when you go to them and say, look, you need to live a certain kind of lifestyle because you're a Christian. You know the first way that comes out of, your, of their mouth? You are judging me. Because the, their preacher told them that once Christ justifies you, no one can judge you. You are saved. Once saved, forever saved. But what they don't know, that justification follows what is called sanctification. Obedience unto Christ. So you grow from faith to faith, from grace to grace. You're growing in Christ, in your experience with Christ. You stop doing the things you were doing, and little by little you're growing in the faith. That is called sanctification. But the first gospel doesn't preach that. Once you're saved, already saved. Sanctification doesn't, sanctification makes uh, a believer do away with so many things that we are holding him or holding her back. But the true gospel, as it preaches justification and sanctification, it preaches that the, both of them are God's doing. Are you together? In the Bible, the teachings of Paul, and our doctrines, we believe that God justifies us and he's the one who sanctifies us. Because it is him who began the work in us and he's going to finish it. 
So both the work of justification and the work of sanctification is God's work. We have to overcome sin. In our own strength, we cannot overcome. Once we are justified by Christ, we should come to him now and say, Lord, sanctify me. Help me to overcome where you overcame. Now, when you talk about justification, there are two things rare. Let me just expand it a little bit. There are two words. There's a cause and condition. What is the cause of justification? Christ caused our justification. He stood on our behalf and declared us justified, free from the prison, like I gave the example of the president pardons people. So Christ has pardoned us from sin. He has said, whosoever wants to, to repent, and might come unto me and repent of his sin, because he has, we are justified in him. But there is a condition. It is just not only justification. The condition is sanctification. The condition is believing. The condition is trusting. The condition is obedience to Christ. So if we, uh, if we have to uh, accept the justification through Christ, we must overcome through obedience, we overcome sin through obedience, through believing and through trusting in Christ. Now, some, some people, they call us, they don't call us Seventh-day Adventists, they call us Seven-day Adventists. But look, look at it, they are actually right. Or oh, that is what we are supposed to be called. Because if you are not holy in the six days, how can you be holy only on one day? You're supposed to be a seven-day Adventist. How can, you, how can you be unholy on the six days and be holy only on the seventh day? So perfection, not perfection, unholiness. Holiness is from God. It's the fruit, it's a gift that God has given us as we trust in God, as we believe in Him, and as we obey Him. So justification is the one, is one, is the third point in the, in my teaching about sin and salvation. Remember now we're talking about the two Gospels. What do they say about justification? The other Gospels say, oh, justification is enough, you don't need sanctification. But the true Gospel says justification is followed by sanctification. You must grow in grace overcoming sin. Now let's move on to the fourth, the fourth point. The fourth point in my teaching about the two Gospels and sin and salvation is the health message and the standards that we should have as Christians. Now, when you come to the health message, the fourth Gospel will tell you those are just rules, you know? It's not eating meat and not eating, not drinking coffee, not eating this and that and that. Those are just rules people have just come up with. You can do away with them. It has nothing to do with your salvation. Just like I was talking to one brother from, uh, I, I went to visit another church, so I found them uh, preparing for the, in the basement of the church, they were putting up a big screen TV. And uh, so I was curious. So and I asked him, I said, I mean, what, what's going on? What's going to happen here? He said, we're going to have a Super Bowl, Super Bowl party right here at church. And uh, if you, you are invited, you come if you want to come. So our, our conversation, you know, went on and to talk about the standards in the church. But the brother, the brother maintained that it's just a game, you know. Sports is just a game. It has nothing to do with our salvation. So I left it at that. But the health message and the standards that we, sh we must maintain are very crucial to our salvation. Let's say, for example... Let's say you have a friend, he smokes, he's a drug addict, he's an alcoholic. Now you help him. Let's say, look, you take him into your house and say, look, you're going to stay in my house until I help you overcome these habits. Let's say six months down the road, the, down the road he overcomes the habits. He becomes clean, he stops smoking, he stops using drugs, he stops drinking. And, and the scientific statistics we all know say that a person who quits these three things, he can live up to seven or nine years longer. Let's say you're successful, you do that for that brother or sister, and he overcomes those habits. 
And indeed he does live seven to nine years longer and he dies of natural causes. Let's say he lives up to an old age and he dies of natural causes. But when Christ comes now, when he's called into judgment, he's found wanting. He's resurrected at the second resurrection after a thousand years. And he's found wanting. Did you help him? How can you say you helped him? How can you say you helped him? Because he was clean, right? He stopped using drugs and he stopped using all these things. But still, he, he did not make it into heaven. So those things do matter when it comes to, a salva to our salvation. Because if you don't live a healthy life, whatever you put in you affects your mind and your body. More so your mind. And how does God speak to us? He speaks to us through the mind. Everything that, every information that we get, whether it's from God or from the devil himself, it has to come to the frontal lobe. And it is, from there it is sieved and goes into avenues, avenues of the mind, or all the way back into the back of the mind where it is stored. Now, if this process here, from the frontal lobe to the back of the mind, if it's clogged because of meat eating and caffeine drinking and all kinds of bad habits, how is the gospel, how is the message of Christ going to help you with your salvation? So to live a health life is good for our salvation. It's being a vegan, being a vegan is not going to make you go to heaven. But what you are trying to do by living a healthy lifestyle, you are helping God speak to your mind and to your body. You're making it easy for the gospel. You're making it easy for your mind to grasp the themes of salvation, the word of God. You're just making it easy for God to save you. It doesn't mean that what you eat and what you don't eat makes you go to heaven, but you're making it easy for God to speak through you and the message of salvation to come in you. Now, apart from the messages, the, the health message, which is very important for our salvation, we have standards. Dressing, entertainment, reading, music, all these things affect us. The true gospel will tell you to do away with these things. Let's say you have a famous, you have a, uh, the program that you love to watch on TV and you are kind of addicted to it. They are, did you know there are people that run from work, they literally run home to go and make sure they don't miss a program on TV or something like that? So they are addicted to those programs. And let's say you spend 75% of your time listening and watching to that program, and you only spend 25% of your time in a day reading the Bible or praying. Who do you think will eventually overcome your mind? Of course, the things that you watch and you read, the things that you follow on TV, they will eventually clog your mind. And by time, by and by, with time, the word of God will grow deaf and you will not hear anymore the word of God in your mind. Because those things, they will come into your mind and just take you away. So the standard, to maintain a certain standard in your Christian life, it's very important for your salvation. And the true gospel that is preached we will include a health message and biblical standards that you must, and me must maintain. Now, God and Satan are both good communicators. God wants you to communicate with you through prayer and through the reading of his word and through listening to his people preaching. You go to church, you listen to a man of God is preaching. God is communicating with you. God communicates also to you through nature, in the silence of nature. You go out in nature and God speaks to you because you see the handiwork of God and the creation of God. But Satan also communicates to us through so many mediums. He communicates to us through, to, through Hollywood. He communicates to us through so many other mediums. So where you, get your where you put your attention can cause you to lose your salvation. So that was my, third, my fourth point in my teaching of sin and salvation, looking at the two Gospels. So the Gospel that teaches a health message and overcoming the habits that we usually follow in this world, 
is part of the true gospel of God. And that brings us to the last point, the law of God. Now here we are talking about the Decalogue. We're talking about the Ten Commandments law. God has so many laws. We have healthy laws, laws of nature. But we are talking about here the Ten Commandments of God. A, first, a false gospel will tell you that the law was nailed to the cross. A false gospel will tell you that the law is not necessary. A false gospel will tell you that obedience is not necessary. And the false gospel will tell you that we're not supposed to be holy. But the Bible says, be holy as God your Father in heaven is holy. A first gospel will tell you that it's impossible to obey all the, the commandments of God. You ever heard people say, we lived in a sexualized society? <laughs> I don't believe that statement because the society itself is not sexualized. What is sexualized is the people that live in the society. The society is good. We just do things that we want to do and blame it on society because that's just the nature of the fallen nature. That's the nature of human nature, right? Remember in the Garden of Eden, God comes to Adam. Adam blames the woman. The woman blames the snake. It's the same nature that we've inherited. All the society is sexualized. Just because you want to dress in a certain way, so you blame it on society. Just because you want to drink certain things, you blame it on society. So a first gospel will teach you that it's impossible to obey God. The first gospel will tell you that just because Christ has saved us by grace, we are once saved, always saved. The first gospel will tell you that the law is, belongs to the Jews, that we in the Christian dispensation, we're not supposed to obey the law of God. But that is a first gospel. Because the gospel of God will lead you to the law. The gospel of God will lead you to look at the law like a mirror. So when you look at the law, you see your own failings, where you have failed God, because the law is the standard of God. The law is not only the standard of God, but the law is the character of God. So when you look at the law, you see who God is. And if you see that you are failing, the grace of Christ helps you now to go back to the level where God is. So the two work hand in hand. You cannot say that we, we did away with the law at the cross because we are now under grace. It is the grace of God that helps us to obey God's law. Now in the book of Jude 24, Jude 24, the Bible says, To him who is able to keep you from falling, why, is the Bible, why does the Bible say that? Because God, through Christ our Lord, and the working of the Holy Spirit, through our faith in Him, we can overcome. We can overcome sin, because sin is a transgression of the law. So we can maintain the standard of the law if we obey Christ, because He has the power to keep us from falling. And we read in 2 Peter chapter 2 and verse 9, that the Lord knoweth how to deliver His people. He, God knows how to deliver us. Sometimes we just cry and cry night and day that I cannot overcome this sin. We just cry that we cannot overcome. But the Bible assures us and that is a promise that God is able and knows how to deliver us from sin. 1 Corinthians 10 verse 13, it says, God is faithful. God is faithful to deliver and to make a way of escape. God is faithful to make a way of escape for us. All we have to do is to acknowledge our weakness before him. You know, sometimes it's not like we cannot overcome a sin. But the devil is very clever. If he knows that you, can, you, cannot, you cannot give in to his temptation, the devil will make that as a habit in you. So it becomes a habit. While you are looking at it like a temptation has come, but you're not, you're not forgetting, you're not realizing that it's a habit. So you must change your approach. It's not a temptation anymore, but you must overcome the habit. Christ cannot overcome the habit for you. He can give you power to overcome a temptation, but he cannot overcome the habit for you. It is your work and my work to overcome the habit. 
Temptation and habits are two different things. So we must be careful when we are praying for sins that we think we cannot overcome. Ask yourself, is it a habit or is it temptation? It's your job and your duty to overcome that habit. The law is a covenant that God has given us to us. So the first gospel cannot be true by saying that the law was done away with because God gave the law as a covenant. A covenant is an agreement between God and us. What we're saying when, you're obedient to, when we are obedient to the law of God is that we are God's people and God is our God. So the law is a covenant, it's an agreement between us and God. When we are disobedient, we turn ourselves from God. We are no longer God's children. When you obey the law, we maintain the covenant with God. The law, according to the true gospel, is the standard upon which we shall be judged. Every man and woman, rich and free, poor and in bondage, they will be judged according to the law of God. And that is the standard of judgment. Like I said earlier, the law is a mirror. It just shows us where we have to maintain our relationship with God. It is the evidence. The law is evidence that God, is, that God loves us. Because God says, if you love me, obey my commandments. John 14 verse 15. If you love me, obey my commandments. So the law of God is evidence that God loves us. If he never loved us, he would not give us the law and the standard so we can... It can show that we love him, we love him, he loves us, and we love him back. If we obey the law by the grace of God, like I said earlier, obeying the law by the grace of God will show the power of transformation that has happened in our lives. If we walk as Christ walked, if we obey as Christ obeyed his Father, we show that Christ has done something in our lives. He has transformed our lives. We are no longer children of, of disobedience, but we are children of God. Hallelujah. We are children of God because in our obedience to God, in our upholding the law of God, in obeying the true gospel of God, and reaching to the standard that God has set for us, we are saying to the world, there's power in Christ. There's power in the transformation grace of Christ. We are showing to the world by our lifestyles that we are children of God and that whoever looks at us as a changed people, whoever looks at us as Christians, they will think and they will say, what has happened to these people? And they will know that once we preach the message, that message will go with power because our lives can testify that Christ has changed us. Hallelujah. And I, I want to end by saying that, brothers and sisters, the first gospel, as I, as I explained the five basic points of the first, first gospel, this gospel has come into a Christendom and has come into our churches today. And you will find that people, even in our church today, they will argue with you over the true gospel of God. But it is very important that you get the true gospel. I cannot ev explain everything. I cannot go into detail because remember, our sermons are 30-minute sermons. God bless you all. God bless you all.